Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXGS Weekly episode 12. Uh, we got a bunch of news today, well not that many articles actually, but uh, some pretty major releases and a ton of really cool libraries and demos this time around and a bit of a silly stuff for the end of it. Hope you had an awesome week. Let's just jump right in and see what we got today in a JavaScript world. Um, hey Mikkel, welcome to the stream. As you might hear, I'm a bit cranky and a bit tired because of all the travels I did uh, this week once again. But, you know, I'll try my best to be um, positive and energetic and everything. But <laughs> let's just get this going, shall we? So, uh, as usual, you can find all the news and everything that I've been uh, collecting on uh, GitHub. Uh, there should be a link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. There should be a link in the channel description if you're watching this on Twitch. Uh, nonetheless, you know, it's uh, YouTube slash building X with JS slash BXJS minus weekly and then you just find it in episodes. All the links are there. As usual, you are very welcome to send me your own links, uh, the ones that you think I missed maybe or just something cool you found or just something awesome you've built. I would be more than happy to have a look at that. But uh, let's get started. So the first article we have today is called what I know about JavaScript uh, testing in JavaScript. Uh, by uh, Yazan Abed, and I hope I do not butcher this name. I probably did, but nonetheless. Um, so this is essentially the um, recollection of thoughts of the author after doing a workshop from Can See Dots about the testing um, and yeah, essentially sort of introduction to testing, if you will, there are some very interesting thoughts here and there. So if you are still not familiar with testing, maybe if you're just getting into it, if you want to understand it more in depth, if you want to see the overview, or I guess recommendations from Kant on uh, from his workshops, then this is actually a really good article to read through. Once again, you know, if you didn't test anything, or if you want to know more, because there's like some advanced topics covered, like mock testing, integration testing, um, there was I think, yeah, snapshot testing was here as well. And even some end to end testing with Cypress, I believe. Yeah, so it is uh, pretty good. Uh, again, if you want to know about testing, or maybe you want to have a refresher do have a look at that. Um, always good to, you know, be able to read through that. That's a pretty well written article as well. Okay, continuing, we got a better guide to open source by Ken Wheeler. Um, yeah, I mean, it is essentially uh, exactly what the title says. It's a guide to open source and a better one. Well, you know, if you ever maintain a, even a semi popular open source library, you know that it might be um, a bit of a pain in the ass to put it mildly. And this article is essentially a set of thoughts and advices on First of all, why you should do open source work, uh, the experience uh, of Ken on working with OSS, and sort of how you actually do that, right? So how you get started, how do you design your API? How do you prepare for release? What you should write, what you should include in terms of the basic stuff like, you know, readme contributing license and all that kind of stuff some bonus points, obviously, and then how do you release and market your thing and so on and so forth? And how do you maintain it? So like the full cycle, essentially, right? So if you ever wanted to um, do your thing, if you ever wanted to open source something, this is a really good guide on doing that, right? And there's a lot of valid points. And I think I've, I agree with pretty much everything that Ken said here, I've uh, did a video on that at some point as well. But this is way more detailed, I would say, maybe. But yeah, uh, if you are interested in open source, do have a read through. All right, continuing, we got an article from Kenzie Dodds on testing. Uh, it's called But Really, What is JavaScript Test? And um, this is essentially a sort of a quick introduction to um, foundations of testing, right? So it goes from the very core and explains what the tests are, how they build and why exactly they do what they do, right? So this starts with a very simple example of what the test is is actually something that checks if two values are if actual value is equal to expected value. And if not, it throws an error, right? Because this is um, in the foundation, this is what the tests are, right? So they just assert something and then throw if the assertion is not true. And it goes, you know, enhancing that adding a cert module and so on and so forth. So it's a really interesting uh, in depth look into how the testing works, how the runners work, and so on and so forth. So uh, if you're not familiar with the, all the 
um, engine under the hood of testing, let's put it this way, do have a look here because it does explain quite a bit. All right. Next thing we have is an article uh, called ES 2018 regular expression updates an opinionated summary. I well, there's a bit of opinion here, but I wouldn't really call it opinionated summary. But it is a really good summary of the new features that we recently got in uh, JavaScript, right with ES 2018, we got some really cool uh, regex extensions, um, specifically look behind assertions. This is something that I've been missing for ages from JavaScript was one of the pains, especially, you know, when you're coming from other language that already has that and you go to JavaScript, and you're like, okay, so how do I write that regex when I need to look behind that might be a bit tricky, but now we can actually do that. So if you are not familiar with look behinds, if you only if JavaScript was your first language, for example, and you don't know what is that there's a really good summary here, with some really good examples. And uh, yeah, you can basically figure out what it does. We also got named capture groups uh, is exactly what you would expect it is so you can actually when you do the capture group, you can uh, properly name it. So that when you have the resulting uh, value, resulting execution, you have dot groups property, whoops, that is not what I wanted to do. But whatever you got the resulting property dot groups, which will allow you to access those groups using their name, not just you know, the index, which is not that nice. So this is just a nicer way to access the result of the regular expression, right? And we got the dot all flag, which is also quite nice, right? Um, so it's like, um, I think it matches the um, yeah, the characters such as new line, but do not match the dot exactly. So it's very situational, but sometimes you do need that. Uh, like, yeah, you, you we, we did have the single line one. And uh, now we have the dot all as well. So it's, it's a nice utility thing as well as the Unicode escapes. So I guess this was important for JavaScript, because it's, it's you know, you're kind of supposed to be multilingual and Unicode escapes might be a problem a bit. But no longer, um, they are no longer a problem, right? So you can actually have um, proper escapes like this. So you just specify what you want, and then slash u flag and you're done. It works really well. And uh, yeah, there's still some features missing, interestingly enough, from the uh, regular expressions in JavaScript, uh, at least if you compare to the, you know, all larger or older, no, that's, old, that's a wrong way to put it. So if you compare to more full, uh, let me try that again. If you compare JavaScript regular expressions to more uh, full fledged ones like in Perl or Python, right, there's uh, some additional features that are still missing like possessive loops, atomic groups and um, subroutines and yeah, some additional minor thing. I mean, they're not that major, right, but it still would be nice. I I'm think we will get them at some point because they are pretty much uh, BCRE, like this, is, this is standard, right? So we, we should be getting them at some point. But yeah, um, again, if you want uh, a refresher, or if you want to learn about the new features, do have a look at this article, it explains it quite well. All right, continuing, we got another article about testing. This time around it's called testing react apps with Cypress. Um, if you are not familiar, Cypress is a tool open source tool for end to end testing of uh, front end apps, essentially, right? So in this case, the guide goes uh, to talk about end to end testing react apps specifically with Cypress. I believe you can test any uh, front end apps with Cypress. So it's just basically a framework for uh, end to end testing, it's not tied to react or anything. But this specific guide talk about react and there's also uh, seems to be a voice option here. I'm not sure how that works. But whatever. So the article itself talks you through it's essentially a tutorial, right? So how to set up the Cypress create a to do app or just download it, I believe it's from somewhere, right? And then how do you add Cypress? How do you write your tests? And I've, I'll be honest, I never worked with Cypress myself, I've seen it, it looks fascinating. And I've heard really good things about it. But I haven't tried it myself, because I had zero chance to do that so far. But um, the API looks really nice. I mean, you basically just have this uh, Sci instance, which is Cypress browser, I believe it is built upon electron, if I'm not mistaken. So essentially, what you do is you controlling electron through a bunch of um, simplified methods, let's put it this way, right? So you can actually like uh, focus uh, elements, you know, and compare classes and uh, get 
elements by the obviously the class name and whatnot and it seems to be very simple to write and very simple to use so if you ever needed a nicer end-to-end -end testing system than something like selenium for example then do have a look at cypress it seems to be really good at what it does all right um continuing we got um, an update actually to observable hq which i've covered at some point like a couple of podcasts back i think um, if you don't know it is basically a scratch pad for web where you can build um, modules like or i guess where you can build javascript visualizations i think they have let me open a new window over here. I think they have some really nice demos. Yeah, so it's it's basically from the guys behind D3.js and it's primarily made for visualizations, right? So you can actually pull the data and then visualize it with, for example, D3.js. In this case, they pull the data. So there's like functions, you can uh, see all of that stuff, right? So this is the render function. They pull the data, where they pull it from? I don't know, they pull it from uh, GitHub, right? So this is a CSV with data and then rendered with D3GS. It looks nice. It's actually interact like um, completely interactive. So I can just, you know, change this code and it will actually change the um, layout of the uh, diagram or whatnot. And the cool thing is they added embedding and downloading the notebook. So this, the page that you saw and this page as well, it's an, it's called a notebook, right? And the cool thing is not only you can download it and you can embed it into other notebook, but you can also import it. So effectively this page is an ES6 module right now, which is pretty amazing because it means you can do something like this. You know, you can import something from Observable HQ. Okay, so this is you import the runtime. Then you can import the notebook itself. And uh, let me disable my notifications here. And then you can import the notebook and you can even uh, just render it into your body if you want to, which is kind of insane when you think about it. All of that with just, uh, you know, modules, ES6 modules API. So it's, it's really cool. Uh, like on one hand, it's a really simple idea, but it is really awesome. And I really dig in it where they are taking the whole like observable HQ, um, app essentially, right? So service or platform, I don't know, I'm not sure. I guess platform will be the correct word here. Okay, yeah, so if you are uh, interested in stuff like this, do have a look at Observable HQ, they do some really cool stuff. All right, continuing, we got an article called Practical RxJS in the Wild Requests with Concat Map, Merge Map and Fork Join. Um, again, basically a tutorial on RxJS uh, with some pretty good practical examples on how to use concat map, merge map, and fork join uh, along with your requests, right? So um, I used to do quite a lot of that when I built my apps based on RxJS, for example. Uh, though all those operations are immensely useful, and if you know, if you understand how they work, and if you learn how to use them correctly that will save you a lot of uh, headaches, uh, especially on merging observables and, you know, combining observables, right? So essentially all those uh, combined observables into one stream. And I, I believe this is all done on example of Hacker News uh, clients that you can just uh, clone on GitHub and have a look how it works essentially and uh, yeah. So if you are interested in reactive programming, do have a look at that. It's a pretty good introduction to those three methods and how they differ and how they um, are more, I mean, not the same, how they can be used in a similar, to achieve similar goals, let's put it this way. All right, next thing we got is another article about RxJS. It's called how to think reactively and animate moving objects using RxJS. Um, again, tutorial, a very basic one on animation using RxJS, right? So the um, way they do that is they use the observable.timer um, abstraction, which provides a timer, right? But reactive one, which you can subscribe to, and then they make it shared, which means it will work in the background without anyone listening to it. So you can actually have some uh, very smooth animations by utilizing the request animation frame. So you can, you know, you can actually move the object in the background and then re render it whenever the browser needs to, right? I'm not sure if they're actually doing that. But this is what I was doing when I was trying to build a simple animation with RxJS. Probably they do that. Um, animation frame now. 
But yeah, essentially, if you're interested in animating moving things with RxJS, do have a look at this. It's a um, decent article. So it, it gives, uh, it goes through the explanation of how you build the whole thing basically from scratch. Uh, also it gives you out some, uh, as you see in here, geometry basics, I guess, and some animation basics. So it's always, I mean, even some physics basics, I mean, come on. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty good one. All right, continuing, we got an article called Angular Ivy change detection execution. Are you prepared? I can really comment uh, much on that because I have not touched Angular in a long time. But this is an article that goes in depth on a new Angular engine called Angular Ivy that we talked about in the last uh, podcast. Uh, I don't know if it's already released or it's going to be releasing really soon. But anyways, basically, there's some did some drastic changes to it. And it looks like it's going to be uh, breaking some of the old code. So you have to be careful about it. And this article essentially goes uh, to look, you know, what you need to do to your code to make it um, work in the newest React uh, Angular version. Sorry. So yeah, you know, if you are working with Angular, if you are an Angular guy, do have a look. This seems to be a very in-depth look and all of that. I believe this is either from the author or from one of the contributors of the Angular Ivy. I've seen his name somewhere in Angular repository. So it is definitely an article to have a look at if you work with Angular. Okay, continuing, we got uh, one directional data binding without framework. It's uh, essentially a tutorial on how to um, write a one way data binding yourself using the ES six proxy, which is actually really simple, right? Because proxy allows you to override the set methods. And um, all you do is essentially on set, you just do the render method or call the render method of your framework in quotes, right? And essentially, that's it. Um, like it does explains a bit about the proxies and, and what the render method should be. But it's a very basic thing. Nonetheless, if you didn't know about this possibility, or if you never heard about proxies, this is a good starting point. All right, continuing, we got a pretty large article from Google guys, as usual, this is an awesome uh, material. It's called JavaScript startup optimization written by Eddie Osmani, who is um, really crazy about optimizing everything. And uh, well, this is just what you would expect from him It's a really in depth guide on optimizing the startup times for JavaScript, including you know, how the JavaScript is loaded, how it's parsed, how do you properly defer loading? How do you work with parsing costs and, and so on and so forth? How does it work on mobiles? You know, it is a very in depth guide. It is really good. So if you're trying to optimize for well, if you're just trying to optimize your website, which you actually should be doing do have a look at that it has maybe not all but 90% of information you want to know or you need to know to actually make your website small and fast. So yeah, all right, continuing, we got um, GitHub gist from Getify. Uh, you probably know him. He does quite a lot of uh, teaching and online work. And he's a pretty cool guy. And the gist is called better promise a strong and experiment is subclassing promise and fixing in quotes a bunch of its awkward bad parts. So it is exactly what it does. Uh, the idea is that we take the promise we subclass it and then try to um, make it better, right? So we, we, or at least he tries to imagine what kind of methods and what kind of changes will would he want to the promises to actually make them uh, account for some of the edge cases like cancellation, right? This is something that's been discussed on uh, in um, TC 39, uh, the um, JavaScript spec group, right? And there's been so much fights over how it should be done. And uh, it is interesting to see what kind of you know, what kind of things people with a uh, big experience want from promises. So it's really interesting. And of course, there is a actually working class here. So it's it's not just article, there is an actual code that you can check out or I guess, clone in gist format and try it yourself and all of it is works because I mean, most of the functions are actually really, really simple. Okay, continuing we got a new TC or, or it's actually not new I'm lying. This is not new one. This is um, TC 39 proposal uh, about realms and it just got moved into the stage two. 
which means it's getting really, really close to release. So if you are not familiar, familiar with Realms, it is essentially sandboxes and uh, it picked up a lot of things from the VM module in Node.js if you ever worked with it. The idea is that sometimes you need to execute unsafe code, right? And you don't really wanna do eval because well, you might be actually screwed because eval pollutes the global environment, right? So what you might want to do is you might want to create a new realm and execute or evaluate your code within that realm, which means that um, once you execute that code, you will get the result, but the um, stuff from within that realm or that sandbox won't escape, right? So you want to actually change the global environment, which is super useful and like, okay, in Node there is VM module and there's like some additional alternatives, but in browser doing that is nearly impossible right now. So having realms in browser would be freaking amazing and would open doors to so many cool things that you could actually do with that stuff. So really excited about that. Uh, we're gonna see how fast it's gonna make it into the official spec. Um, the fact that it moved to stage two, that means that there is not that many things blocking it from final release because I mean, there's like stage three, stage four, and that's it, I think, right? If I am not mistaken, yeah, so three is a candidate and then four is finished basically, which probably means it's gonna be a 2020 or something. But we're gonna see. Basically, pretty, pretty cool proposal and really excited to see that making into the core of the language. Okay. Another proposal that is moved to stage two is top level of eight. Um, uh, this is, I believe, yeah, the link to the diff actually, but uh, where is the proposal itself? Top level of eight. So yeah, the idea is that, you know, a sync of eight is really nice, but having to do this is slightly annoying, right? And I always, like, for example, I write 90% of my code in a sync of eight way right now because it's just nicer and uh, I always have the main function that is starts the app and it's always a sync and I always invoke it and then catch the error and uh, it's just a bit of a pain in ass, right? So what the um, top level away does, it just says, okay, you can just, you know, you can just do awaits on the top level without any wrappers, without any async functions, which is really nice. I don't know, like it's probably ubiquitous for browser and node, so really nice if they actually uh, finish it. Again, it's already on stage two on the draft stage, which means there's not that many blockers. So we're probably gonna see it quite soon in the uh, final implementation, right? Okay, another cool thing coming to the Node.js is uh, Worker, which is essentially a threading support in Node.js via Workers. Um, it's The API is similar to um, uh, service workers in the browser but instead of being service workers this is effectively another thread right and api is super simple so you create a new worker from uh script right the same way you would do with um, service worker and then you just listen for messages errors or exits and that's it and this is effectively another thread, which is kind of great when you think about it. So um, multi-threading is Node.js in Node.js is something that would be very interesting to explore, especially with the upcoming big end support. We're gonna see how all of that progresses. And uh, again, this is just the initial implementation is not even merged yet. So I'm guessing this is gonna take a few more weeks, maybe, maybe months to merge, depending on how it goes in general. But Nonetheless, it's really exciting to see that, uh, you know, Node Core is actually getting so much cool new features. All right, continuing, we got, oh yeah, Smooshgate. Uh, so if you didn't know, there was this whole uh, flatten, array flatten methods, right? That could not no longer be named flatten because flatten function was in MooTools and it didn't work the way that new flatten should work. So they couldn't do that. They would break the gate, uh, the break the web, and they decided to name it Smoosh. And people was like, "What is that? We don't want your Smoosh." So there started the Smoosh gates, right? So there was a hashtag and everything, and people was like, "No, we're not gonna. We not. We don't want that. We want a proper name." They finally resolved it, and it's now just array dot flat and dot flat map, which is I like flat is a bit weird, but you know works. And flat map is exactly what you would expect what is, for example, already existing in like RxJS and it makes perfect sense. This is not perfect, but you know, better than Smoosh, I would take it any day. 
So it's great. Uh, we now have a right flat and a right flat map and they are coming to the Chrome very soon. I believe it's already in Canary maybe. I don't know if they have updated it yet or not. But anyway, it is just great. Right, uh, continuing we got um, if you didn't know, for whatever reason, uh, ES6 modules are supported in Firefox since Firefox 60, right? We already talked about this, I believe. But today, or that was, I believe, May 25th, so yesterday, actually, Firefox Nightly got support for import meta um, proposal. So this is already stage three, so it's nearly like finished, basically, right? And the idea of it, if you're not familiar, is that you can get miscellaneous information about the module you imported from the meta uh, element from import, right, which is sometimes can be very useful, basically. And now it is officially already in Firefox and then come into Chrome and others quite soon, I believe. All right. Next thing we got is yes, this is absolutely amazing. Um, we got big ins in Chrome Canary, you can just download Chrome Canary and try them right now they already work. And as you can see here, you can actually use uh, big ins to add more than once to the max safe integer, which is quite huge for JavaScript, I would say like this is not not something I expected to see from JavaScript ever, I think, you know, because you never would think anyone would use JavaScript for working with numbers, which is like, I don't really know if that's the if, if that's going to change anything, I don't know. So uh, we're going to see how that goes. Um, right. So next thing we got is um, moving towards secure by default indicators. If you did not know about that. Uh, so by, right now, Chrome shows this uh, padlock thing, right? That is um, indicates that your connection is secure. And um, in Chrome 69, which is Canary now, I believe, and coming in September, it's just going to show you the padlock. And at some point, it's not going to show you anything. But if you go to the website that requires input and uh, is not HTTPS, you will see the not secure prompt, which is in my opinion, really good. And it is way nicer to assume that everything is secure by default now and then you know, warn users when the data is not secure. Um, why this is possible is primarily because of the let's encrypt, right? Yeah, there's the not secure uh, warning, for example, so it's going to be just information if you don't enter anything, but once you enter it, it's going to warn you to say, hey, you know, you might be sending your data uh, over unsecure channels. And uh, hugely, this is possible because of the existence of Let's Encrypt that allows just about anyone to get HTTPS on their website for free, which is amazing. You know, if you are working in a company and you're using them, please support them uh, if you have an um, opportunity to do that because they are amazing. All right. Continuing, we got a small tip uh, on using object assign on a string, which is like I found this snippet to be really cool. So basically, you can use object assign on a string to assign properties, right? So in this case, uh, you have like colors array, which has the gray color, which is sharp, and then DDD. And then you can assign sub properties, which would be light and dark, which would be gray light and gray dark and it's exactly gray light and gray dark colors, which I found to be pretty neat. And I can see more than one use case for um, that kind of pattern, which is pretty neat. So I'm gonna see if that's uh, actually a good idea or not. That's a different question. But it is quite, you know, it looks quite neat, at least. <laughs> All right, next thing we got is another small tip uh, this time around for VS Code. Turns out I did not know that you can actually um, customize the window title. So you can go into your options, you, the user settings, and then you can set the variable windows.title into just about anything you want. Um, and there's like, like the, you know, the default one is um, sometimes doesn't really work well. So I actually changed it for my case. But the docs have or actually the, the settings themselves have a really good explanation of what kind of variables you can use and what they do. So if you were unhappy with the default VS Code title, you can actually configure it yourself, which is, once again, just amazing. Like, I mean, I absolutely love VS Code and its uh, versatility. All right, next, we got some releases. So we're finally done with the news. Let's talk about the releases this week. Um, first, the really big one is Jest 23. 
with uh, blazing good snapshot features and it seems to be mostly focused around the snapshots actually so the cool thing is that now you will be able to um, I don't know if you guys can see that but basically when you run the just uh, snapshot update it will actually now interactively show you each snapshot that was broken and ask you if that's okay to update or not which is really useful because before I used to you know update it and then just go into git diff and check if everything is actually right so it's a bit it was a bit annoying this looks very way 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 better and uh, summaries are now nicer so better logging and uh, da -da -da -da. oh yeah there is now this is a really cool feature so you have snapshot property matchers which means you no longer need to somehow clean up your data for tests you can just define the property matcher so like it usually was a huge problem with the dates specifically we had like a different time zone and then you know you have to first create the date then remove it from text or paste some placeholder there or whatever and then create a snapshot from that uh, with remove date so that you can actually test it properly it was annoying as hell so now instead of doing all of that, you can just say, hey, here's the, you know, it should be any date. And if as long as it's date, it's gonna be a normal, snap, like passing snapshot, which is really great. And there's, yeah, a bunch of additional things. So if you are using Jest, if you're interested, do have a look. Um, it's all great. It's, it's, I mean, I've been using Jest since version 21, I believe, or maybe 20, and it's been pretty awesome. So give it a shot if you haven't. All right, next release we have is NGRX6. If you did not know, NGRX is the RxJS based uh, store implementation for um, Angular. It is heavily inspired by Redux and essentially Redux on um, RxJS, right? So there's like reactive Redux. Um, it is pretty cool. I've tried, I've used it in a couple of projects way before when it was like version one, I think. And it's a really solid piece of uh, tech. And uh, if you have never tried it, do give it a shot. It's really good. They just released version six, which um, I honestly don't even know what's the new stuff there because they don't really describe it there. But I'm guessing, you know, if you work with it, you probably know if you never work with it, well, there's your chance to give it a shot because as I said, I personally really like the API and the way it was built. All right, next thing we got is Node 10.2.0. I believe there's actually already 0.2.1 or something. Um, yes, there is 0.1 with some minor fixes, but um, majorly it was like a fix for memory leak and add-ons. There is uh, some additional yeah, like FS now provides the named experts for the six modules and then um, more consistent HTTP close and aborted events handling and some other, you know, minor things. So it's a minor release. Again, it's more or less maintenance. As usual, there's a billion of fixes and uh, patches here. So if you're, if you want to have a look at that, go uh, knock yourself out. Uh, but yeah, you know, really great to see Node develop in essentially they have releases pretty much weekly or maybe bi-weekly, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. Okay, next thing we got is a React version 16.4. Um, minor update, but it has um, support for yeah, very requested feature and something that I've actually battled myself against, uh, pointer events. So if you didn't know, React had an abstraction for click events, right? But if you wanted to work with pointer events, you actually had to do it yourself manually on the DOM with like add event listener. And it was a bit of a pain in the ass. So they finally added it into the React DOM. So you now actually have proper set of pointer events that is like, you know, down, move up, whatever. And they work in, I believe, all the browsers, um, latest versions of Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and even Internet Explorer, which is kind of great. And um, if you, yeah, it depends why you use, so, okay, you, they also recommend using polyfill if you need to. And yeah, there's obviously a bunch of bug fixes and stuff like this as well, as usual. But the pointers are the highlight of this release, essentially. Okay, continuing, we got Yarn 170. Major thing is the Node 10 compatibility and um, I believe it is focused workspaces. So before we go into the details on focused workspaces, the, the guys are like, change log coming tomorrow. That's been 23rd of May. Uh, I think there's still no change logs. I was waiting for it yesterday, but 
I could not find it for the love of me. I don't think it's it's still out. So there's <laughs> something is happening there. But they released the article that is basically highlights the focused workspaces feature. Um, I never actually worked with workspaces in Yarn because you know the workspaces allow you to have more than one package within one project. So I never needed that myself. So I never worked with it. But it seems to be they're basically enhancing it and improving the way that you work with it, uh, which is kind of great. So you know, if you're using that feature, do have a look. It seems to be really powerful. And I mean, Facebook guys themselves are using it for quite a lot of repos, actually. So it is really cool to have that. And if you need that, definitely have a look at the improvements. All right, next release we have is styled components version 3.3.0. The reason why I wanted to highlight that is because they've added this one little thing, first class support for objects. So if you never seen styled objects, it's a pretty popular library, as you can see by the stars, for defining styles for your, um... oh God, come on, for your React app, right? And uh, the way it was done before was like this. So I believe it's not purely React as well, but whatever. So I, I, I read about it using with usage with React, right? So you usually did it with uh, template strings, which uh, kind of, I mean, it looks okay, but it always irked me a bit, you know, sideways. So I, I never felt convinced by it. It just doesn't look good enough. I don't know why. It's just like, it's, it's a personal, like it's a personal preference essentially, right? So I was like, eh, maybe, maybe later. I believe style component is actually used within Next.js. Uh, so yeah, always, you know, the styles, like the, the string literal template, template literals always like looked a bit weird, but now they actually added the option to write exactly the same stuff using the objects, which is great. This personally looks 20 times better to me. I don't know about you guys as again, this is just a personal preference, but I would 100% write like this instead of uh, template literals. So yeah, if you never saw it, then maybe give, give it a try. It's uh, pretty good. They even have a 4 roadmaps. roadmap. So we're gonna see it uh, this summer, which is pretty exciting. Let's see what they come up with. All right, next release we got is actually RxJS. We talked quite a lot about it today, actually. They released a 6.2.0 with a bunch of bug fixes and a new operator and width. Um, not much to say about it. I mean, they are always doing an amazing job on this library. And every time they release a new major version, at least they just change so much things in a good ways, always. I don't think there's all there is any time I've seen the major release that was bad. There's basically there's some really talented people behind it. And I am honestly amazed by their work every time. So yeah, uh, if you never worked with RxJS, I highly recommend it. Do have it, uh, do give it a spin. It is great. And if you never did reactive programming, that is something that you should try and learn because it's a really cool pattern. All right, continuing, we got NPM version 6.1.0, which, well, it's named next zero here, but I believe it's already been live since like a couple of days now. So um, it adds NPM audit fix that we talked about a couple, like, I believe in the last podcast or maybe two podcasts back. So basically the idea is that when you run npm install, npm will now warn you if you have any um, dependencies that might be compromised, right? And npm audit fix will actually fix this for you, which is great because you don't have to think about that anymore. So it's kind of awesome to have that baked in into a package manager. Um, yeah, there's now some additional audit features like, you know, way to print it to JSON and then some summary outputs and, and whatnot. Uh, the npm init package feature has been added so you can like create react app and stuff like this. Um, I believe we already talked about that. So I'm not going to stop on this here. And uh, yeah, so mostly it's just about npm audit fix because this is sort of the highlight of the release. Uh, but it is a really good highlight. So do have a look at that. All right, continuing we got Vince 2.0. Um, it is actually all right, this is demos and libraries section. So we are now switching to that side. I believe, is it demos and libraries? I'm a bit confused. Yeah, it is demos and libraries. So this is gonna be the first demo slash release, I guess still, because it is a release announcement. Uh, Vince 2.0, so if you are using RSS, well, they are saying it's time to revive RSS, but I don't think it's been dead actually. It's been, I, I don't even know if it's been on decline. I honestly been using RSS for ages. I mean, Google Reader died. Yes, it was unfortunate, but that's, so many good services out there that I don't know, like 
But if you prefer to run your own infrastructure, if you want cell hosted thing, then do have a look at this one. So it is um, RSS reader essentially that you can self host and it looks really nice, really fancy. And yeah, it seems to be uh, built with uh, MongoDB and Algolia for search. And there's like a bunch of pretty cool technologies underneath and it supports podcasts. So, you know, if it looks like something you would use to have a look, maybe maybe it's gonna be useful for you. All right, continuing, we got a library called Omi. Uh, it is a uh, Preact plus Scope CSS plus store system plus native support in just three kilobytes of JavaScript. I believe this is gonna be gzipped because I don't believe this is gonna be in, you know, unpackaged JavaScript, that cannot be true. But um, it looks pretty cool. So if you are looking for all in one package, obviously, this is going to be opinionated. Um, this looks like a great option. And it is super tiny, it goes with Babel and some presets for it. Uh, so yeah, do have a look if you're looking for something like this. All right, next thing we got is our suit. Uh, suit of react components. Um, looks very fancy. I believe it is from one of the Chinese companies. What was it? Was it Alibaba or someone? Um, I don't know if there are any affiliations here. I don't think so. Actually, okay. I remember I've heard somewhere that was from like from one of the Chinese companies, but hell if I remember where, but essentially, it's just a really good component library. Um, my JavaScript is completely blocked. Let me do that. So that we actually see some elements come on reload. There we go. Yeah, so you have some really nice looking buttons with all the you know, fancy stuff happening some icons and uh, there's a lot of components in here. So if you're looking for a sort of minimalistic, um, minimalistic library that would give you the components for react, I believe it is react, right? Am I not forgetting things? Um, to the, the design guide. There we go. Um, it is react. Yes. So if you're looking for the react components library, then this looks pretty damn good, to be honest. And uh, where's my components again? There we go. Yeah, so you got everything you might want. And you know, even popovers and alerts, notifications, loaders, dividers, progress, radio, like this, even some complex stuff like sliders and, and upload component, which for react, which is actually really cool, man, I should have a closer look at this library. Some of this stuff is really impressive. And there's a tree in Chinese, maybe that's why I thought it was by one of the Chinese companies. Okay, whatever. So do have a look looks really good. Uh, continuing, we got a hybrid library. This is um, abstraction for web components. That yeah, essentially allows you to create web components with a simple and functional API. So if you never try to create web components, like on its own web components are really nice, right? Because it's a standard way of shipping components for the web. It is a great idea, it has a great spec, but they are kind of a pain in ass to create, right? If you ever tried it, you will know that there are some problems involved in that. Well, this essentially allows you to do it in a simpler way and um, in a functional way, which is also great, or you know, for some people at least who prefer functional way of programming, like I do. But uh, yeah, so if you are in need to build web components and you don't really want to use the default way of doing that, do have a look at hybrids. It looks pretty damn nice. Continuing, we got a hotkeys. Um, it's a keyboard input library. Essentially, no dependencies. Very small, very lightweight. Um, I think there was a size somewhere. Uh, yes, 1.73 kilobyte gzipped or three kilobytes without gzip, which is pretty great. And again, from China, Chinese guys have been delivering some awesome stuff lately. Great to see. Um, the API is super simple. Like this, this way of uh, specifying the hotkeys is pretty great. Um, usable from unpackaged, usable from modules, obviously. You can use it with React if you want to. And yeah, it is, seems to be a very straightforward one. So if you were looking for the complex hotkey combination library, then do give a look for this one. It seems to be really good. All right, continuing, we got just launch. It is a Node.js module that allows you to launch any browser on any OS with a fresh session. Um, Supported browsers and operating systems, quite long list, right? Uh, if you are looking 
for something like this do have a look i personally used opn last time i believe from uh, sindrosaurus um come on open it up yes i believe this is the module that i used was it from cinder yeah it was from sindrosaurus so this is the module that I typically use uh, in my apps, but here is like, you have to specify what you want in the flag, right? So it might, it might be a bit different from the other library, but you know, all right, next thing we got is a remote function. Um, essentially a library that simplifies our remote procedure calls in Node.js. So you have two sides, you have the server creation and then you, server provides some methods. And then you got a client that connects to the host by the IP address and you can call with a wait the methods from server. Um, I gave, it's a very specific thing. Um, you know, if you're looking for something like this to have a look at this one seems to be a pretty nice abstraction, very simplistic, but you know, maybe you don't need more than that. So right next thing we got oh yeah this is awesome i absolutely love that when i found it. It's uh, wired elements. It's a set of UI components that look hand drawn I mean, look at that, that is all components, there's like actual buttons and everything. Those are web components. And um, I mean, just look at that. It just looks so great. I'm absolutely loving it. It's basically intended for uh, mock ups and prototypes, right? And um, it's just great. I mean, like, I, I don't know if I would use that anywhere, but that just looks amazing. Like, look at this stuff. Absolutely loving the style of that stuff. Like for mockups, absolutely. That that's probably works really well for demos. Uh, maybe for some very specific demos, but yeah, it's like, you know, pretty cool stuff anyway. All right, continuing, we got Hypenopoly. I did not know that was a thing, but uh, apparently sometimes you need client side um, hypernation and sometimes you need the polyfills for that. I honestly have zero idea what is this about. I mean, hyphenation is the, the minus sign between the words, right? The hyphen. So I don't think I ever worked enough with, with words. Is that about line breaks? Maybe that's the thing. So I don't think I ever worked enough with uh, stuff like this to actually understand what the hell is going on. Um, hyphenates the text if the user does not. So yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what's going on basically. But if you ever work with hyphenation, if you know what is that about, then have a look at that because this seems to be the polyfill, which means that some browsers don't support it, and this seems to support it. And uh, it also works in in. It's written in WebAssembly, which is even crazier. Okay, that made it take it on a completely other level. Okay. So yeah, you know, if that's your jam, then have a look. Continuing, we got Marble JS. Um, really like that one. It's uh, reactive, again, built on top RxJS framework uh, for HTTP for the Node.js, right? So it's it's like ExpressJS, but reactive, right? In a very dumb way, basically. And it supports middlewares and everything in a very uh, cool way because again, RxJS allows you to do some crazy things like like this, right? So this is, you got the request, you can match it to the user, you can match it to post. It looks a bit strange at first, but when you think about the possibilities of um, combining core, I guess, um, what was the name? Um, so in functional programming, what was it? The, I am too tired to remember the words properly. Um, was it the combining functions? It is not combining functions, right? What do you do when you like call one function after another chain? No, not chaining functions, but you know what I mean, whatever. So let's just skip it. I'm trying too hard to remember what it's called, but uh, basically it allows for some pretty interesting code. I'm not sure. That's basically that, you know, like using something like this would mean that you need to have a team that has expertise in reactive programming and functional programming. Otherwise there will be problems with teaching uh, juniors, especially what the hell is happening in here, but it does looks very nice. All right, continuing, we got Nano.js, um, which is a standalone JavaScript library for DOM manipulation, very small one just 100 lines of code, 0 0.6 kilobytes gzipped, and seems to be aiming to sort of uh, replace a jQuery for DOM manipulations, which is quite nice. And it works in IE9 and later, which is also great. 
As you can see here, this is the functions that are available. They are pretty simplistic. So it's specifically focused on working with DOM. You won't find any fancy stuff here, but it does look pretty nice. So if you are looking for a library that you know to replace the uh, jQuery or something very, very small that would just work with DOM, then this might be your thing. Okay. Continuing, we got Saber.js, a minimalistic framework for building static websites with Vue.js. We, there was official Vue.js static builder that we covered um, one of the previous podcasts, right? Yeah, Vue, Viewpress was it. Um, this seems to be an alternative. They do provide the FAQ and uh, compare it to um, other existing solutions. So if you are still looking for a static site generator and you want to use a view based one, do have a look at this one. Looks pretty good. I mean, it has a decent amount of stars, it has a decent amount of commits. Seems to be quite active. Uh, so, you know, all good. All right, continuing. We got V. <laughs> I'm going to try to pronounce this now. V. No. Vido? Viewdo? I, like, I for the live, I, like, I don't know. View doll, I guess. V I'm not gonna try to pronounce it anymore. <laughs> Screw that. So we got this library, which is um, I covered the React based one last time, right? So we had the native desktop applications for Windows, OS X, and Linux using React. Well, this time around, this is for Vue, right? So it's works more or less the same way. It takes the libuui uh, bindings and uh, Node libuui specifically and binds them to the view templating language, which results into compilation of those really nice native windows. So if you did not like the React version, if you do not like React Native uh, Desktop or whatever it was called, do have a look at this one. Maybe you like the view version better. It seems to be quite nicely done as well. So there's like docs and everything is here and uh, yeah, seems to be decently active too. Right. Next thing we got is our model JS. It's a very simple 1.2 kilobyte model dialog with no dependencies, which is nice to see. Um, there is a demo on Plunker, um, which, you know, the uh, model is actual proper model. And um, yeah, it seems to have very straightforward API, very easy to use. Again, very small. And uh, if you were looking for something like this, do have a look at this one. Right, continuing, we got Last.js uh, with a pretty nice logo here. Um, it is a scaffolding for modern Node.js uh, packages. So if you ever was too lazy to set up your own package, if you need to do that on a daily basis, this scaffolder will do stuff like set up the unit testing for you with Iva, linting with ESLint, and Prettier XOR standard, uh, Markdown linting with Remark, formatting with Prettier, git init, npm install, all the basically whatever you want to set up, you know, what do you typically do for the packages, obviously opinionated, you can just uh, run this scaffolder. So if you were looking for something like this, do have a look at this one. All right, continuing, we got, uh, well, another package from Mr. Sinrisaurus, who's been uh, as productive as ever. It is called make deer, and it is essentially make deer minus P. Um, if you ever try to create a folder in Node.js, you know that you cannot do it. Uh, you cannot create like the non-existent folder, right? So you have to create them recursively. First create the unicorn, then create a rainbow, then create a cake can be annoying. So having a package that would just do that for you is way nicer. So if you need to work with deers to have a look at that as usual, super simple, super reliable, and yeah, 100% test coverage. Basically, what do you expect from Mr. Soros? Always great. All right, next thing we got is and design. It's a set of components and uh, seems to be a design system as well with like user experience in mind for enterprise applications from uh, again, Chinese guys, I don't remember. Was it the AliExpress guys or was it someone else? No, it was some of us AFX. So I don't know who's that. For some reason, I have this super weird animation jank here. I'm not sure where it comes from before it worked before. Uh, sorry, before it worked fine is what I want to say. But right now the animation seems to be just super jank. I'm not sure what happened. Like this was not the case before. I guess I maybe triggered something. Maybe just... Anyway, this is a component system, right? So we got all the nice like buttons, very slick looking, by the way, even the default theme is looks really good. We have the grid system, again, also react based. And then there's like, yeah, navigation, breadcrumbs, whatever you can imagine. 
Again, a lot of components, including the more complex one, like, you know, trees and everything with uh, even custom stuff like checkboxes and, and uh, things. It's, it looks really good, actually. Not sure about the animation problems on a title screen. I'm not sure, like, I, it didn't actually happen before. So <laughs> maybe I just overloaded my browser by opening all those stuff and the tabs, you know, because it was, it was a lot of stuff. But uh, yeah, it looks quite nice. So if you are, again, you're looking for React JS components to have a look at this one. Uh, they also have a pro version somehow, but I have not investigated that. But uh, do have a look. Looks uh, pretty good. And uh, thanks to Yatki for sharing this link this week. Uh, I would have missed that. Um, right. Continuing, we got Audio Worklet Polyfill. So um, this is a polyfill for Audio Worklet, and uh, I something like this is the area that I completely. Uh, oblivious about right so turns out there is like I know that there's the web audio API right turns out there's a whole bunch of related APIs that I didn't know about one of them was audio worklet and um, there was an article yeah there you go introductions in Debo so audio worklet allows you to do background sound processing essentially in a offloaded thread, right? So that you don't clog the main thread, which is sounds pretty reasonable to me because you know, audio processing can be quite heavy. And apparently, this is a pretty new API and some browsers don't support it. So crazy people from Google was like, Okay, we'll just build a polyfill. And this is exactly what it is. So if you're working with audio in JavaScript, and uh, if you want to work with audio worklet in older browsers, do have a look at this polyfill, it seems to be quite insane, actually. Right, continuing, we got another polyfill again from Google Chrome Labs, guys. Um, I talked about CSS Paint API quite some time ago. Um, if you do not know about them, they've been added in Chrome 65. And what you can do is essentially you can um, define your own CSS Paint API. And then you can in CSS say paint with my API. So in this case, they define a very um, eye melting checkerboard, right? So all of that is defined as JavaScript. And obviously, this is a very new API, they've only been added like a couple of months ago. And most of the browsers don't really support that. But now they do, because now you can just throw in this JavaScript polyfill and it just works. And as usual, Google guys doing incredible work. Uh, so if you ever need to use CSS paint API and want to work with all the browsers, this is where you go. All right, next thing we got is Night Owl, a theme for VS Code that looks very slick. So if you were looking for a new theme that looks really nice, do have a look at this one. It's, um, yeah, I, I really like in the colors. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm gonna switch from material theme that I typically use, but that looks very slick. All right, next thing we got is um, collection repository. Uh, it's called JavaScript algorithms, and it's essentially a, uh, huge list of algorithms and data structures implemented in JavaScript with explanations and links to further reading. So basically, all you need to know to learn how to implement linked lists, queue, hash tables, heaps, priority queues, and so on and so forth. So if you, if you ever wanted to up your game in the foundations of computer science, this is probably the wrapper to look at if you want to do that in JavaScript. But yeah, uh, it's just a really good collection, basically. And there's also big annotation and all other useful things that you might need to know sometime. All right. And the last thing we got in demos is awesometalks.party website, which is a collection of awesome talks, as you would expect. A really good collection to say. So there's a lot, like a whole lot of really, really good talks on a variety of topics here. The cool thing is that you can sort it and filter it by uh, speakers. And there's a lot of really good speakers here. So like all of those guys are really, really good. And you can also do that by categories, um, you know, if you prefer. So there's like JavaScript, GraphQL, testing, UX, WebAssembly, whatever you can imagine. It's not strictly JavaScript, but there is so much really cool things here that I highly recommend you to have a look at that, you know, since you're consuming video format anyway, have a look there. Uh, they seem to be doing a lot of really cool things. Um, yeah, and apparently you can add your own talks as well. Uh, that is not what I wanted to do. But uh, yeah, so if you have anything to add, go and add it over there. Um, before we wrap up, we got a couple of silly things. First one being by the time you're 35 joke, um, which I found to be absolutely hilarious. So by the time you're 35, you should have successfully vertically centered the div at least once. 
Um, I guess, you know, in the world of uh, Flexbox and um, CSS Grid, it might not be as funny as it was 10 years ago, but man, you should try doing that without Flexbox. <laughs> just once, just, just give it a shot. And the other thing, which is, well, it's, I guess it is silly. Um, you probably know that GDPR is now in effect, right? So the websites have to comply to GDPR. You probably already got like 200 emails talking about privacy policy. And uh, this is a really cool example of what the GDPR does to websites and how much garbage we actually load uh, that is basically does not respect your privacy. So um, the guy here who's a web performance expert at Akamai um, took the USA Today website and compared the loading of the US site versus the French site, right? So in the US, they don't have to comply to GDPR, so they don't care. They can track you however they want and they could not give less shit. In the France, which is EU, they cannot longer do that, right? So they have to actually ask you before tracking you, which is impossible for like majority of US advertising companies. So they just remove them all. And um, yeah, the website went from 5.5 megabytes and 835 requests from 188 hosts, just think about those numbers, to 297 kilobytes and 36 requests to just first party hosts. <laughs> just imagine how much garbage they send just to track you. It is like there's a, there's a chart comparing that the time. It, look at the timing. It's like two seconds to the full rendering and first interactive, right? And 11 seconds on the same internet, I note, right? To the full load and first interact in the, with all the garbage that they included, which is, is just insane when you think about it. And if you still was doubting that GDPR is a good thing, well, at least to some extent, right? I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it's, it's quite good uh, for consumers at least. Then, well, there's your really good example. All right, um, I'm basically done. So if you guys have any questions or links that I might have missed or any suggestions, do post them into the chat right now. I will just turn on the light real quick because it's getting a bit too dark. Oh, there we go, much better. So feel free to post the links into the chat right now. If you don't have any links or any questions, we can just wrap it up here for today and uh, have an awesome weekend. Um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, I'm basically that's it from my side. I am, as you might hear and as you might see, I'm a bit, a bit tired from all the travels and all the EF stuff again, once again. <laughs> On one hand, I cannot wait until this stuff ends. On the other hand, well, it was kind of fun. Um, yeah, thanks Mikkel for watching. Um, always great to have you on streams and have you talking in chat. You know, I don't really, um, really appreciate it basically. All right. Um, seems like no questions here. Seems like no other things to discuss. Well, then I would say let's just wrap it up here. Thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you for going through all of this through all the 12 episodes. Holy crap, that's been that is, you know, I should, I should probably celebrate at some point. I mean, that's been, we've been going this for quite some time. We need to do something fun on like episode 20 or something, hmm? maybe 15. We're going to see. All right. But uh, yeah, guys, have a great and awesome weekend. Uh, enjoy. As usual, if you find any cool news, send them my way on Discord, on Twitch, on Twitter, whatever the way you like, or on GitHub. Again, there's the issues open, so just throw it in there. Would be ha more than happy to cover it. If you create your own project, even more so, send them my way. We'll be more than happy to have a look and uh, throw them in here on the next podcast. Thank you for watching, and I see you next week. Bye. <laughs>